Okay, so we're gonna talk about the overview of the congenital um, heart anatomy. Um, and, and I will send this out um, to all of you uh, and give you these slides. So you'll have this coming back and we're gonna go through this pretty quickly. And I wanted to remind everybody, this is not the only thing you'll need. You'll need to study, you'll need to really to start memorizing some of these concepts about where the different parts of the heart come from and where they go to and what survives and what doesn't survive. Um, so, but here's some more resources that you'll have when I send this um, uh, out to you, or you can go back and see them again as you review this. So the overview of the embry uh, embryology, um, let me see how I can... Um, is the cardiovascular system is the first major system to function in the embryo. I and mean, I think it's very important to look at this because often the heart is developing before the woman realizes that she is pregnant. That's one of the things that's very important for us to, to, counsel, um, uh, to counsel people about uh, that the, um, they need to be prepared in terms of good nutrition um, and good behaviors before they um, even consider about getting pregnant um, because the heart will be largely developed maybe before they even know they're pregnant. So it's the, it's the first system to function in the embryo beginning in the fourth week. The growing embryo cannot satisfy nutritional oxygen needs by diffusion alone. So as it gets larger, as it starts to grow, initially it just gets all of its oxygen and nutrients through diffusion. But as it gets thicker and bigger, then it actually needs a blood supply. Uh, it's an amazing thing that God designed. This did not happen randomly by chance. This is a design because it cannot be something that gets made sequentially. It has to be uh, something that comes together all at once. You don't go over a million years. This slowly gets better. If the heart doesn't go through all of this, you never get a functioning embryo. Um, so this is a testimony to God's design. But on the left part of the screen, you see, starting at three weeks, you, you see the development of the embryo. And then at 21 days, the, you see the heart tube. Um, and then in 22 days, the heart begins to beat. In 23 days, it starts to loop. Um, in 28 days, it, it loops on itself and twists. And then in the fifth week, you start to see that the different chambers are forming, the conotruncal swellings form. Um, on six and a half weeks, the septum are largely formed and the valves are largely formed. In eight and nine weeks, you get separation of the outflow tracts. And by the 10th week, you have the semilunar valves form. So many of these things are, are completely done um, very, very early in pregnancy. Um, Um, the heart begins, as I said, the heart begins to beat by 22 days and the blood flow can be visualized by Doppler in the fourth week. The timing through the eight weeks of gestation, if you look at the first week, we have fertilization, then the marula and blastocyte uh, implantation. In the second week, we have the bilaminar embryo. It has two layers, primitive placenta and an early mesoderm. In week three, we have trilaminar now it has three layers of the embryo, the cardiogenic plate forms, there's a primary heart tube, contraction starts to begin. Um, in the fourth week, the looping of the vascular system. In the fifth week, we see the RV and the LV form, the pulmonary veins form to the left atrium, the foramen of valley is formed, the osteum primum is closed, the RV um, uh, uh, is, and the sixth arch and the LV in the third and fourth arches develop. In the sixth week, the AV valves start to form. The ventricular septum is nearly complete. Look at that, it's six weeks. We see that it, the, the um, ventricular septum is nearly complete. Um, the trunk septation starts between the fifth and the sixth week, but semilunar valves start to form and then the right arches disappear. It's very interesting that, that this bilateral uh, cardiovascular system Many regions of it have to um, not only form early, but then resorb. <clears throat> and if depending on what resorbs and what doesn't resorb, tells you what kind of heart defects we have. Why do we have a right arch versus a left arch? Why do we have um, uh, an interrupted arch? All these things have to do with, with um, portions of the embryology that either function properly or don't. But you can see on this chart, if you look at the beginning of the critical period of cardiac development, it's actually at two and a half weeks. 
Very few women understand that because if you consider when they ovulate and when they're most likely to get um, uh, uh, conceive, then they wouldn't know that they really conceived to probably at least two to three weeks afterwards because that's when they would have their normal menstruation period that they would not miss if they were pregnant. Um, and so, but that's the critical period of cardiac development. So I think that early nutrition and make sure people are taking care of themselves is very important when women of uh, childbearing uh, years. In, in week seven, we see ventricular septation is complete. So you know by seven weeks whether they're going to have a VSD or not. PFO and the PDA remain until after birth. And this is all before eight weeks. Um, the overview, the anomalies, you see the heart-forming epiblast on the far left, and you have the heart-forming mesoderm. Um, if you don't have this formation, if this doesn't all come together, then you get a ectopia cordis, or the heart on the outside of the body. I've only seen one of those in my entire career. Um, if the primitive heart tube doesn't loop, then you get L transposition. When in the early looped heart, if you have if there's a problem with the cushion tissue, then you get detransposition or uh, atrioventricular septal defect. If you have a problem with neural crest migration, you um, you get truncus arteriosus. Um, if you have late looped heart, you get muscular septum. You have a single ventricle. Um, if you don't have septal alignment, you get double outlet right ventricle or tetralogy of flow. Um, uh, if the four chamber heart doesn't form with proper cementation, then you get BSDs and ASDs. These things are all that are happening very early uh, in the time of, um, uh, of the formation of the heart. So if you look at the early development of the cardiac muscle cells during gastrulation, cells that give rise to heart move to anterior and lateral positions. That means they are sort of on the top and the sides. Signaling from the endoderm may cause expression of cardiac specific genes for these uh, cells that can develop into many different types of cells. Um, they're oriented in a, a, a cephalo to caudal direction or a head to tail direction. So the cephalo, uh, cephalic cells or to the head are the outflow portions and the caudal cells are the inflow portions. I hope you guys are appreciating how amazing this is. Um, for the early development of the heart tube, the horseshoe-shaped prospective pericardial cavity is located in a pre-cephalic position. And I'll show you pictures as we go on. So it's the rostral to oral and neural plate. Mid-third week, the cardiac muscle cells and visceral me mesoderm form a plexus of vessels that become the horseshoe-shaped endocardial tube. The lateral plate, the visceral mesoderm, surrounds the heart tube, becoming the myocardium. The epicardium develops from cells migrating over the myocardial mantle. So here you see this neural groove, you see this bilateral function, you have a bilateral dorsal aorta, you have a notochord, you have the neural groove, um, um, and you can see the blue layer, the pink layer, and then the small yellow or orange layer. Those are the three <clears throat> layers, the trilayers of the heart. But you see the dorsal aorta is bilateral and then you see the endocardial heart tube um, is um, more, um, uh, more um, posterior, um, but bilateral as well. The um, heart tube is basically the endocardial layer surrounded by a myocardium with intervening layer of extracellular matrix or what we call cardiac jelly. This is all the connective tissue. It will also form the, the, um, um, all of the uh, electro, um, uh, uh, electro um, active cells um, uh, that, will that will control the beating of the heart. Um, the cephalic ends connect to the midline and also connect with the dorsal aorta via aortic arches. Um, so now we have a connection of the heart tube with the dorsal um, and, the, and the aorta to all the aortic arches. And the caudal end develops and connects with the umbilical veins that are developing in the yolk sac. Here you see the heart tube now starting to fuse together from being two uh, posterior lateral structures to become one heart tube. And the dorsal aorta will do the, the same thing as it forms its branches. The uh, embryo is undergoing lateral body folding, um, head tail folding, and cephalic growth of the brain. Um, heart tubes shift medially 
They have to come to the center line. They have to ventrally and caudally, they have to fuse in the midline. So you get a single endocardial heart tube. This tube is suspended in the pericardial cavity by the dorsal mesocardium. The embryo now is beginning its fourth week of gestation. So all this has happened in 28 days. And so you see that wall of that heart tube now becomes a single tube with the endothelium in the center and then the myocardium. And then the, the dorsal um, uh, mesocardium is what's holding it in this pericardial sac. Um, and so you can see how the heart is starting to develop and the thorax um, will, will sort of become as part of that pericardial uh, cavity, the lungs will grow in. And you can see anterior, um, you can see where the, um, do, uh, the dorsal aorta is coming uh, together. So the vascular circuits, these are blood islands that coalesce to become three vascular circuits. There's the embryonic circuit. This is the paired dorsal aorta that arise from the endocardial heart tube and it's drained by the anterior and posterior cardinal veins. Um, uh, the reason you know you have these anterior posterior bilateral veins that's why sometimes you get a um, a left um, uh, SVC is if that vein doesn't absorb um, then you get a persistent left uh, a left superior vena cava instead of um, uh, just a um, a right sided superior vena cava. Um, there are extra embryonic circuits, the, the vitellin, which is equals the blood from the dorsal aorta into a vitellin aortic um, arch, supplying yolk sac. It drains back to the heart by a prayer vitellin vein. Um, the umbilical vessels are the dorsal layer to the umbilical artery to carry back deoxygenated blood to the placenta. Um, blood and the blood is back burning via the umbilical vein. So here we see the heart tube. And as we understand this, the tubular heart elongates and develops alternate dilations and constrictions. So if you look at the sort of the top, we see the aortic sac. And that follows by the, this is like the truncus, uh, uh, truncus arteriosus, uh, the truncus portion. And so this will develop the aorta and the, um, and we'll go into this detail, but I'm just giving you so you can see it all in, in what the heart tube looks like. The truncus arteriosus is going to fall, um, develop in the aorta and the pulmonary artery if everything goes right. What it connects to is the bulbous cortis. The, the conus is the proximal bulbous cornice. This is why you get double outlet right ventricle, but you do not get double outlet left ventricle. Embryologically, it's impossible. Okay, so the bulbous cortis um, develops, and especially the proximal bulbus, it develops into um, the right ventricle. The primitive ventricle will develop into the left ventricle. So if we don't have formation really of a conus or a proximal in the uh, proximal bulbus in the bulbous cortis, what you can get is just a primitive ventricle that we say, well, it's not necessarily a left ventricle, it's not necessarily a right ventricle, it's just primitive. And so that little, you see these little indentations these are the separations from the truncus, the aorta and pulmonary valve, the bulbus, the right ventricle, the primitive ventricles, the left ventricle, then the next are the atria, and the next are the sinus venosus, which develop in the IVC and SVC. And each one of these has a little indentation, which is showing the different type of cells that will develop in each of those locations. So you can see the sinoatrial groove is, is separates the, um, uh, sinus venosus from the atrium. The atrioventricle canal separates the atrium from the primitive ventricle. Um, and then the bulbo ventricular interventricular foramen separates the primitive ventricle from the bulbus. So this is, you can see where all the septations are going to occur. Cardiac looping really starts on the 23rd day. And so the cephalic or the head end bends ventrally and caudally and rightward. This is, requires an enormous amount of cilia rotation. So when you have Cartagena's disease, when the cilia don't rotate normally, then you get abnormal looping of the heart. So the fact that the, the, um, the cilia beat a certain direction is very important to how even the heart loops. The atrial segment assumes a position cranial to the ventricular septum. So you see that what has to happen is the atria now have to somehow get above or more cranial than the ventricles. 
and they're going to be the bring the drainage of the sinus spinosis with them. So there is a twisting that the eight, the bulbous cortis is going to have to come anterior. That gives you your your semilunar valves and your right ventral are going to be anterior. The, the primitive ventricle goes posterior. That's why um, the left ventricle is posterior to the right ventricle. And then the atria has to swing around and come on top of the left ventricle or the primitive ventricles before it's septated. And that allows the atria to drain into the ventricles and then the sinus venosus will come up and then it will split and you'll have one form the SVC and the other form the IVC. Um, the, and this is, when we're looking at the cardiac looping occurring when the, the crown rump length is five to six millimeters. So this is a very, very tiny um, embryo at this point. Um, so the bulbous cortis forms most of the right ventricle and parts of the outflow tracts of the aorta of the pulmonary trunk, as we said. Um, and I'm going to go over this multiple times to sort of start drilling it into your minds of what's going on. And you guys will have to do this on your own, okay? The primitive ventricle forms most of the left ventricle. The primitive atrium forms the anterior parts of the right and the left atria. Um, the posterior parts are formed by actually the pulmonary veins coming in. And then the right and the left horn form the sinus venosus, forms the superior vena cava and part of the right right atrium and eventually will be attached to the inferior vena cava. Um, so the crown rump at the same crown lump, rump length, you see here the bulbous cortis moves inferiorly. So it has to join the primitive ventricle in this place and it's anterior into the embryo's right side. Next, the permanent ventricle moves to the embryo's left side, and the bulbous cortis moves inferiorly anterior to the embryo's right. Next, the permanent ventricle moves to the embryo's left side, and the bulbous cortis moves inferior anterior to the embryo's right side. You see it more, happening more. And then the primitive atrium and the sinus venosus move superiorly and posteriorly to form the primitive ventricle, and the primitive ventricle moves to the embryo's left side. The bulbous cortis moves inferior and anterior to the embryo's right side. And so that's how we get all the different sidedness of the heart. Now the sinus venosus is in now the posterior position. Remember when we're trying to do cardiac catheterizations, when we're trying to get in the sinus, sinus um, the uh, superior vena cava, what do we have to do? We have to be in the posterior portion of the heart. If we want to go to the AV valves, we have to be in the posterior portion of the heart. If we want to go to the outflow tracts, we have to go to the anterior portion of the heart. So that primitive atrium in the sinus venosus moves superiorly and posterior. So now we see that the left ventricle is posterior and the sinus venosus is superior, both being posterior. The primitive ventricle now moves in the, 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 it's in the embryo's left side and the bulbous cortis is now anterior. You see this all in this picture. The primitive atrium, and so now you, the sinus venosus is now posterior to the primitive, primitive atrium. Um, and so the six week of gestation, the common atrium is located posteriorly and connects to early embryonic ventricle being the atrioventricle canal. So what has to happen is the atrium and part of the atrium and the, and the um, uh, ventricle now have this connection um, but it's just now twisted, and the atrioventricular canal primarily is directed to the primitive LV, right? Because the primitive, um, the primitive ventricle is the LV, and the sinus venosus is where the atria is going to come from, and so that's primarily directed until the IV, until you have septation of the of the primitive ventricle. So the primitive atrium and the ventricle are formed. The bulbous cortis is presented and is composed of three parts. There's the proximal portion, which is the primitive RV. There's the conus cortis, which forms the outflow tracts. And that's going to be what we would consider the conus or the infundibulum. And then there's the truncus arteriosus that forms the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. What does this look like? You can see that the atrioventricular canal that comes in is primarily directed to the left ventricle. And then you're going to see this septation. The interventricular septum is going to grow into two sections. And then with that, the outflow tracts are going to have to move 
And so you have an intraventricular septum that you're going to have to have um, uh, is going to close, but at that same time, that atria is the the aorta is going to have to come in and 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 stay attached to the left ventricle. So a lot of complex stuff is going to have to happen in the sixth to seventh week of gestation. If any of these things go wrong with the septation and the formation of the how the outflow tracts move, is you get double outlet right ventricle. You have a VSD, and then you have both um, uh, outflow tracts coming out of the bulbous cortis. So the primitive um, atrium becomes the common atrium. The primitive ventricle becomes the LV, the bulbous cortis. As we said, first part comes becomes the trabecular RV. The mid portion becomes the conus, and the others become the outflow tracts. The distal one third becomes the aorta and the PA, but that is one tube and will have to septate into two, and the pulmonary artery will have to go anterior, and the aorta will have to go posterior. The sinus venosus becomes a systemic venous system in the smooth part of the right atrium. Cardiac septation, the major septa of the heart for the atria and the ventricle forms between fourth and sixth week. Um, the mechanism is two actively expanding masses of tissue grow toward each other and fuse. Um, active growth of one tissue until it reaches the opposite side of the lumen. So you typically have these moving together and then when they touch, they stop. If they don't make it to each other, then you have either atrial septal defects or you have ventricular septal defects. And this all depends on the synthesis and deposition of extracellular matrix and cell pro proliferation, which is often dictated by that cardiac jelly that we talked about earlier. So let's look at atrial septation. Here we have the atria where you see um, early in development, like I said, we're still in the fourth, fourth week of gestation going forward, is we have, and, I'm, and the picture that you see on the left side is if you were to sort of cut down the middle and then it, sort of like the, the anterior posterior view of the heart, and then the um, B is the lateral picture, what it looks like from one side to the other, looking from the right side to the left side. And here you see this osteum primum and an inter interventricular foramen on the B very clearly. What happens if these don't close? You get an atrioventricular septal defect or a complete AV canal. Um, and so you can see this is, we find this out very early. This is between the fourth and sixth week that this, that this failure, we know this child is going to have an AV canal at this point. So the atrial septum is formed by three components, the primum septum, the secundum septum, and the endocardial cushions. So you see the, in these, you septa, see a septum primum. You don't see the septum uh, 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 secundum yet because it grows in and you see these endocardial cushion. So it, if the endocardial cushions don't grow in, that's why you get a AV canal and that's why it's called an endocardial cushion defect. The first to form is the septum primum at four weeks gestation. It grows inferior and meets the endocardial cushions, closing the osteum primum. Um, if it does not meet that cushion, then, the, then you have a primum atrial septal defect, which also affects the mitral valve. So step by step, A is lateral, A1 is the AP view. So it's the same view, it's just looking at two different ways, okay? So you see the septum primum that's going to have to start growing in. You see the foramen primum, and then you see the endocardial cushions. And as we and, and this is between 31 and 39 days of gestation. So now the septum primum starts growing in. Okay, and ongoing there, there between the lower rim of the septum primum and the endocardial cushions is this large um, off, a foramen primum or ostium primum. And then as you can see that, that septum primum has grew, grown in, there are perforations representing the developing frame and secundum in the septum primum. Um, and this is what will be basically, it sets up the frame and ovale. Um, so you see it on the lateral side very clearly. And then on the AP side, you see, now this is growing down towards the fused endocardial cushions. And before closure is complete, cell death produces these perforations that allow blood to go through. 
Um, when the perforations coalesce, they form the ostium secundum. And the ostium, and then the, you have a foramen secundum or the ostium secundum, and then you have a foramen primum. Um, and then extensions of the endocardial cushions. Now the endocardial cushion has to grow up and along the edge of the septum primum to, final, to finish the closure. And so in this view, you, what you see in the AP view is you see the endocardial fusion with the septum primum, okay? And you see this very thin developing septum secundum. And this, this forms, this is a new fold that forms and it grows in from the top of the atrial dome. And here, so you see this septum on the right side of E1, you see this septum um, primum with the foramen ovale. And then on the left side, you see that septum secundum starting to grow down. And you can see why there is going to be a flat valve from the septum primum up against the septum secundum is what we see in children as a foramen ovale. Opening of the left septum secundum is now the foramen ovale, as I said, and now we see how the blood can go through from right to left um, until there's um, really major pulmonary blood flow because there's very little cardiac output to the out the outflow track on the right side um, until we the the child starts breathing. Once the child starts breathing, the um, you can see the septum primum snaps back to close the foramen ovale, um, and you and you force the um, blood to go out to the lungs, come back through the left atrium. Um, so the upper part of the septum primum degenerates that you see, and now we just have a septum to secundum coming down from the roof of the atria. And then the septum primum should fuse with that shortly after birth to close the atrial septum completely. Um, and whatever remains, if we, have, if we don't have enough growth of the septum secundum down, or we don't have enough of a septum primum, then you're left with an atrial septal defect a secundum atrial septal defect. So what forms what? The rim of the fossa ovalis um, is the septum secundum. It, it, it comes down from the roof. The valve of the fossa ovalis is formed by the septum primum. So when we see what we say is a floppy um, um, PFO, it's because the septum primum is floppy. Um, and then the slit-like openings are the fossa ovalis. So let's look at atrial septation again in, in um, a, a different picture so you can see how it looks. So you can see A and B are the initial start where you have the septum primum coming down, but you don't have any septum primum or in, inter, um, endocardial cushions connections yet. And then C and D is, is that as the uh, septum secundum starts coming down on what looks it's like the right side of the, of the heart. Um, and the septum primum coming up from below is really, you can see it's more of a left heart type of structure. And then the endocardial cushions fuse. And then as it continues to go, you have this flow in E and F um, and G, you have this foramen ovale forming between the secundum septum and the, um, and the um, primum septum that allows blood to flow right to left until the baby starts breathing. Um, and so you see at, at the atrial septa at various stages of development on the right side, it's six millimeters at 30 days, it's six millimeters, um, uh, you can see that. Uh, in, in the next stage, it's nine millimeters. And then in the last stage, it's 14 millimeters. And that's approximately at 37 days. Um, that takes you all the way through how the atria um, septates. So clinical correlates. For an osteus secundum ASD, there's excessive cell death and resorption of the septum primum. Okay. There's inadequate development of the septum, septum secundum. For an osteo primum ASD, there's partial fusion of endocardial cushions in the AV canal, and the interventricular septum is closed usually combined with a cleft of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, because if there's a problem with the endocardial cushion, that endocardial cushion is also what's involved in making that mitral valve. 
if you understand that that fusion problem, you understand that that septum primum is usually on the sort of a left-sided atrial component and why it affects the mitral valve and not the tricuspid valve. In a common atrium, you have failure of septum primum and secundum to form. Those cells that were going to make those parts just didn't form. And so you get a common atrium like we see in Ellis Van Crevel, where they have six fingers in common atrium. So atrial ventricular canal septation, um, we see here in this picture on the right, you see what looks like an AV canal echocardiogram. But this is at the end of fourth week. This is what it looks like. This is what it should look like. The problem in the AV canal is it never develops further from this place. So the atrioventricular uh, endocardial cushions form at superior and inferior borders of the canal. And initially the, the canal is directed only to the LV, but by the fifth week, it's divided equally by the bulboventricular flange. And the lateral cushions also are present. So you have lateral cushions and um, uh, interventricular septum cushions that are, that are coming in to close this to make two different ventricles. Um, here is a different way of looking at the septation. Here you have the common atrioventricular canal. Then the next step is the, the inferior endocardial cushion and the, and the superior artery, um, cushion start coming in. Here in the next stage, you see it goes further. And then the last time you have, um, you have now a complete septation of the ventricular septum. Superior and inferior cushions grow towards each other and eventually fuse, as you see on that far right side. The um, septation of the atrio, um, um, atrioventricular um, uh, septum, you see these fusions of these in superior and inferior cushions. They separate the left from the right. The anterior leaflet of the mitral valve becomes more undermined. Septa the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve forms by undermining of the right side of the inlet septum. The inlet portion becomes more smooth. The rest of the valve tissue support the apparatus from pr proliferation of the mesenchymal tissue. Now the inferior endocardial cushion, after inferior cushion fuses uh, with the superior cushion, there is further proliferation. And on the atrial side, the proliferation helps the primum atrial septum. And on the ventricular side, it helps to close the membranous portion of the ventricular septum. So we have muscular septum, but then we also have membranous septum. So if we look at this, this is how the, we're going to get through the blood coming back through the sinus venosus by the right atrium is going to come into both of the, um, through the right and the left side of the primitive ventricle. So since endocardial cushions divide the AV canal into right and left orifices and help to close the osteum primum and participate in the formation of the membranous intraventricular septum, failure of fusion in a common AV valve, um, so failure of fusion results in a common AV valve and intraatrial communication and intraventricular communication. Um, so that's, um, that's, um, how that occurs. And now we have the septation of the ventricular septum, which is different than the AV septum. Um, so the muscular interventricular septum grows as a ridge of tissue from the caudal wall towards fused endocardial cushions. So the interventricular foramen is the opening that remains between muscular septum and the fused endocardial cushions. So as we look at this, the interventricular foramen is closed by the membranous part of the septum and is formed by the muscular interventricular septum, the endocardial cushion tissues, and the conal ridges from septation of the truncus, arteri uh, the truncus and the conus. So the membranous septum is the outgrowth of tissue from the inferior endocardial cushion along top of a muscular septum and fuses with conus cordis cushions. The conotruncal septum is fusion between the conus cordis cushions fusion between the truncus arteriosus cushions and fusion between the conus cordis and truncus arteriosus cushions. The muscular septum it, it has the medial walls of the muscular portion of the ventricles expand and become opposed. And then the later fuse with the outgrowth of the inferior endocardial cushion along the top of the muscular septum. 
I don't know, guys, but it seems to me that I'm amazed that every child doesn't have a VSD, doesn't have an ASD, doesn't have AV canal. So the clinical correlates here is depending where you have failure of these fusions, you either get a, a conal type defect, a conal truncal type defect, which might be called subarterial or supercrystal. If you have a problem with the membranous, you get a membranous defect, or you can get muscular defects, or you can get an inlet defect if you have problems with the endocardial cushions. So muscular defects are a fusion of medial walls and the expanding ventricles. Uh, inlet VSD, incomplete coalescence of the trabeculations from the inlet region of the ventricles. And then the outlet are failure fusion of the conal septum. And then the, finally, the membranous VSD is a failure of the growth of the right or left bulbar ridges of the posterior endocardial cushion. So it looks like we need to um, log on and start again, if I understand correctly. Is that, is that true? Um, yes, Dr. yes, Dr. Kirk. We just, uh, uh, we did just go out and then re-log again. Yes. Okay. All right. We'll talk to you guys in a few. Yes. Yes. Thank you.